So thank you for being here, Alessandro and I we are very delighted uh, about this session. Um, just one word, few of you already agreed to be in the volume because we are going to publish uh, the presentation in the second DH volume. <coughs> we just have one, the first volume is currently under press uh, with Brio and we are busy working on the Digital Humanities number two. Uh, we know that we're supposed to reply to our email with guidelines, but we had some problem regarding guidelines and we were working uh, on it for uh, Digital Humanities volume one, and now we have set up all guidelines, so we should be able to send it to uh, um, so if some of you wants to, to be published uh, and you did not reply yet, please be free to be in touch with us. Uh, it shall be published the beginning of uh, 19, uh, 2019, yeah, December or February. Well, not published, but I mean go on the press. Uh, so most of the time in this, uh, in this volume, there is uh, uh, talks from um, annual conference as the American School of Oriental Research, uh, so CAA, um, American Oriental Society, and so on, but only digital, uh, digital humanities uh, talk, of course, with peer review. So you want to add something else? No. That's all. We, we hope you will contribute to the volume because uh, <coughs> so it, it is a nice experience. It is a little novelty in our field and uh, it, it's a nice experience to it's a little bit groundbreaking. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we can begin with yeah. the with the first part of our session and the first speaker, uh, Martina Poli. Uh, who will present uh, a paper she, she prepared with Sorin Hermann, Simon Giussere, Jan Drissen, Giussi Sorrentino, Athanasia Canta, Joachim Brettschneider. Uh, this first part of our session is, uh, as you can see, on the topic heritage, uh, 3D models, and we will, begin, we will begin with this paper on Cyprus. Uh, you will have about 20 minutes to talk and then five minutes for a short discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Martina Polik. I'm a PhD student from the Cyprus Institute and from the University of Ghent. Uh, I will talk a bit about the use of 3D models in object analysis and in particular about um, a special find from Pila Kokinokremos in Cyprus. And I will first give you a brief overview of the site itself and uh, the context of the find. And then I will go a bit through the methodology and the results in the end. Okay, so Pila Kokinokremos is situated in um, the south eastern coast of Cyprus, so here where the little star is. Um, it's about 800 meters inland right now, but they, there are indications that originally the coastline breached until the foot of the hill. So the entire platform um, seems to be inhabited actually. So all this area here is quite large um, and quite densely so and also with um, units that suggest that uh, planning of the site was, that there was planning for the site and um, that it was also abandoned in a planned manner. Uh, this is so because there were several findings of hordes, so people had time to make uh, to hide their most precious uh, things in a very organized manner. So they were hoping to come back, but eventually they didn't. Um, it's dated to the late Bronze Age, to the 13th and 12th century, but it was occupied for a very short period of time, so 
even less than 50 years because there's only one layer. Even though now in the last excavation they found something that could indicate for the first time more than one phase. And it's also particular because it, is, it has a very international character. So we have finds from all over the, med the Mediterranean. So from Sicily to <coughs> Egypt and uh, also the Levant. Um, it has been excavated in uh, several periods, not the entire plateau, but only sections, uh, parts of it. Uh, the first time in the 50s, then another time in the 80s by Karajorgis. Maybe some of you know him, which is one of the biggest figures in archaeology on Cyprus. And uh, then the next time now uh, in 2014, and 13, again by Karajorgis and Afanasia Kanta, which is now also partaking in the dig. And then in 2014, there was a bigger excavation campaign planned uh, between the University of Ghent and the Catholic uh, University of Louvain in collaboration with the Mediterranean Archaeological Society and Afanasia Kanta. So now I will uh, talk a little bit about the uh, fine context of my particular find that I uh, investigated, which comes from the sector three, which was excavated by a team from, uh, from the Catholic University of Devon. So this is how it looked like. Um, they found this in one corner of one building, they found, so this is the building, and in one corner they found this big jar and beneath it there was uh, an Egyptian flask, complete, and uh, inside there were lots of finds. These are the finds. Um, so there are some, uh, some beads, sigils, uh, rings, and a few metal objects, and among them the object that I analyzed, which is this little uh, bronze figurine and here you see it uh, after the, the cleaning and the first restoration works. Um, now I want to talk a bit about the objectives of this study. So they are mainly twofold, from an, they are archaeological and methodological. Uh, from an archaeological point of view, uh, we wanted to contribute to the knowledge about uh, this kind of figurines in the late Bronze Age. So unfortunately, there are very scarce um, finds of these um, bronze figurines in the late Bronze Age. Um, from Pila, there's only one more example, which is, which is that one. And I will talk a bit about it more later on. And then there are a few other examples from Enkomi, for example which is another important uh, Bronze Age site in Cyprus. Um, so particularly, we wanted to understand stylistic and typological relationships between the few finds that we have and the one that uh, was found in Pila. And also how it was used and handled, because uh, as you've seen, the top is modeled like a figurine. So we have a head, and then it finishes just below the neck and it becomes, uh, for lack of a better word, I will call it now like a blade. So it's very thin. So it suggests that it was also, it's not merely ornamental, so that it was also handled in some way. And we try to understand in what way. And then finally, from a methodolo methodological point of view, um, we wanted to extend a bit the use of 3D models for the analysis of objects because right now they're mainly used for other prehistoric studies but they're very much concentrated on weapons or lithic tools and not so much on objects like this which normally receive only a, a typological <coughs> um, descriptive analysis and nothing else. So why using 3D models for this kind of analysis? Um, the most straightforward and intuitive ones are these ones that I just listed. So one advantage is that 
um, you can see the object without the color, so you're not distracted by it. Especially with metal objects, you, they are, you don't have this um, glare when you turn it and things like that. Uh, you're very flexible with the light positioning and the lightning. This is just an example. Unfortunately, the screen is not very good, so you don't get the effect so much. But it's a little bit like RTI, if you are familiar with it. It allows you, just with a normal 3D visualization tool, you can just position your light however you want, and you can highlight details and see details more easily. Um, it's easy and accurate to make measurements, everyone knows that. You, have, you don't have the scale issues in the visualization and uh, then there are many other things you can do with it. These are just the most simple ones um, that already give interesting results, but then you can do more advanced analysis that imply also um, quantitative uh, approaches. And uh, we will see a few examples of that later on. Um, the acquisition of the find, so this is our, we have this nice truck, <laughs> which is our mobile lab. Um, we parked it in front of the museum where the object is stored, because they didn't allow us to bring it to our own location, uh, where our institute is situated. Uh, so we had to bring everything there. This is the scanner that we used, so it's a Barkman structured light scanner. A smart scan. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the Breukmann, but it's it's a wide structured light scanner and it works like that. that it projects a pattern on an object and then there are two cameras or one camera depending on how you want to use it, uh, which records how the pattern is deformed by the object you're trying to record and then for triangulation it gets the, the, the surface of the of the object you're trying to scan. So this particular scanner works much, much better in dark environments. So um, we had to close everything and darken the windows. And we used a close range lens with a maximum field of view of 49 um, per 40 millimeters to have a higher resolution. And it can reach an accuracy of 0 0.008 millimeters and a capture density of 0 0.04 millimeters. So now here it is important to remember that these are the ideal values. So the scanner can reach these numbers, but it doesn't mean that your own scan will have it because you are not working in an ideal environment and if um, there are any issues within the quality of the data, the scan doesn't record everything. So it depends on the setting of your quality threshold. And if it's below that, you get actually less points. So your capture density in the end will be lower. And it's important to be aware of that, especially if you do morphological analysis. Mm, so this is the final 3D model. Um, the, the, the frontal view, side view, back view, and again the other side. It's about uh, six centimeter in height. Uh, this is an orchid view, of course, and um, two centimeters large in that direction. And you can see that the, the the blade is very thin, so it's between one and two millimeters. Um, unfortunately, the screen is not good, so you can't see it properly, but so this is one centimeter and this is more or less one millimeter, sorry. So it's very thin. Um, and you can also see very well that uh, there's quite a lot of corrosion on the, on the object, especially here in the back, so all these little bubbles are corrosion. And there's also one interesting element down here at the bottom. We will have a closer look at later on. Um, the mesh density check, this is, relates to the thing that I said before about uh, the capture density. So since you don't really know 
how dense your mesh in the end will be, even though the scanner tells you it has a maximum capacity of 0.04 millimeters, um, you still have to check because if you want to look um, at the morphology of the surface and the differences, for example, between smooth areas and more rough areas, it called the smooth areas could also be due to less points in that area. So it appears to be smoother, but in reality, it wouldn't be. So that's why it's important to, to check if your mesh density in the areas you're interested in is um, comparable with each other. So what uh, I did here is I created uh, small slots, so two per two millimeters, and uh, made samples all over the, the figurine, then calculated the area and saw with how many vertices it is represented to see if I can compare it or not. And uh, it was actually okay. So I, I could know that I, if I see a smooth area, it's because the area is smooth and not because there are less points. Um, so now the morphological analysis itself, starting with decorative ele elements, which uh, were unnoticed beforehand. So you can see that the, um, this maybe was, was possible to be seen before as well that uh, the figurine has this headpiece, <coughs> it's either a headdress or, or the hair itself, and it has one missing link, and you can see nicely that it's plated. Now, we don't really know if this was on purpose or if it was broken afterwards somehow. And in the area of the eyes, you see, um, that are, you see the eyebrows very nicely the eyes themselves, of course, and that there are these, um, these little circular protuberances above the eyes and uh, the eyebrows. So they took uh, quite a lot of care in modeling the face and introducing small decorative elements. Um, then at the back we noticed something interesting because at first glance the figurine seemed to be male um, but we saw that they're actually at the back, you know, it's a bit dark. Um, there were two braids, two plates going down. They were just broken off and it was very difficult to see before. At one side it was better recorded. You see even the, the two elements that are made of the braids. So there's, there's one here and then the other one beneath. <coughs> that makes a curve on the right side. And the left side, it's very little left. It's broken. And um, this is a reconstruction of the left side. I didn't uh, make it very long, um, because <coughs> we don't really know. It's hard to tell if they, how far they went down. Uh, but on this side, on the right side, there is there's this little thing that suggests that it could have been uh, longer originally. And then there's this big blob here, which it's also hard to tell if it's corrosion or if it's part of the original plate. So when you compare it then to, to other figurines, these are the two or one, two examples of Enkomi, of the other Bronze Age site in Cyprus. Um, you see that the braids or plates are usually associated with female figurines. Um, our figurine you can't really tell because um, it ends at the neck, so you don't know if um, there were any breasts or not. But the plate suggests that it was then female. It's quite different stylistically from from the male figurine, other than the, the circular headpiece. Um, because otherwise it, it's much more fine, the eyes are made differently, and also the lips, but we have similarities in the ears. <coughs> They're very big, and uh, the, the nose as well. Mm. The next part of the morphological analysis was more concentrated on um, uh, the use and the handling. 
So again, here, <laughs> the screen is not very good. So this is uh, the back side of, the, of this blade-like end. Uh, I, uh, first maybe I mentioned this part. So this is again corrosion. Here you see it better. This is the front side and it goes continuous at the back. And you see these lines. It looks like um, I was, when I first saw it, it made me think of either bone or wood. And um, in, the, in the flask there was actually bone. So and there, it happens that on metal objects you can find corrosion when in contact with organic matter. You can find things like that, so it's probably something from, from inside the flask that in contact that made something like this. And then, as I said here, it's not very visible, but at the very end of the back end, at about one millimeter height, there's a little bit of a smoother area. And I will show you the next slide where it's hopefully better visible. So this is a curvature analysis, which highlights small changes within the curvature of the 3D model and so it helps you see small differences. Um, so here it's quite homogeneous and then there's a, a rougher area, you see it much more uh, blue and red dots, and then it gets smooth again. Whereas in the front side, it's everywhere it's the same. So what uh, this suggests is that this could be from uh, use, that it was kind of polished. Um, but it, it's hard to tell because of the corrosion. Ah. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, go far to conclude how much you So um, there are also differences in the face. On the left side is much more rough than the, than the right side. Uh, this is another comparison, and this is the um, um, the ho hypothesis how it was used. So this is face upward, so the back side where it has the small polished area um, in a low angle, you would have you scraped it basically, either to left and right or front and back. Um, and the <coughs> conclusions that it's it's very difficult to tell between corrosion and what's actually smooth or not smooth, and also this uh, symmetry of the object design. Uh, I wasn't able to talk about that. And um, the logical conclusions: it is helpful in identifying elements that um, you wouldn't necessarily be able to see without 3D, or it's very very difficult. And it's, uh, it's possible to, to experiment more freely and to, to use the model as you wish and um, make experimentation, touching hands and movements. And the logical conclusion is that the plate suggests that it's female, um, that there was quite careful modeling in the face. Uh, it's a bit difficult to compare it and um, the hypothesis of the the handling of the object. Um, thank you very much. I'm sorry that I went over. <laughs>